Courtney, are you ready? I am. Okay. Well, to give you uh, to give our audience an introduction to you, Courtney Little, our speaker today. Courtney graduated from the University of Arkansas in 1995 with a Bachelor of Science in Business Management with a focus in finance. He was the liaison between inside sales and architectural sales for U.S. Aluminum before returning to ACE in 1997. Courtney opened the Northwest Arkansas branch for ACE in 1998 before attending the William H. Bowen School of Law, where he earned his Juris Doctor with honors in 2004. He closed his private practice in 2008 when he purchased ACE and was named President and General Counsel. Courtney, thanks for being here with us today, and I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Um, I was looking at the list. I think I know a couple people on there, but I'm glad to have everybody else attending today. Um, something else that's uh, new this year is on the 2018-2019 uh, president of the American Subcontractors Association. So as you'll see here in just a minute, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today comes from my practice uh, as a uh, real estate construction attorney, but also as general counsel for our glass company. And then obviously uh, these issues are coming up uh, across the nation with not just uh, glazers, but uh, masons, uh, drywall, subs, other people. So hopefully today's information will be good and um, be helpful to you. Uh, the things that I'm gonna share are, have come from my deal. Sorry, I'm trying to hit my, give me a second. All of a sudden mine won't uh, let me change. Here it goes. It's not changing slides for me. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, so y'all get to see I'm having a technology issue here, uh, but I'll go through and start. Oh, goodness. Can you see that, Sarah? It locked up. There we go. Let's see if we'll do it this time. Okay. Is that All right, so I'll fix my screen real quick and we'll get right back to this. All right, here we go. Okay, so I'll leave it back up. And begin. Oh, nope, it doesn't like that. Okay, I'll just leave my laptop open. This will be easier. Okay, sorry about that. So um, today for the outline, I'm, I chose 10, and this is 10 out of about 50 subjects that the uh, Subcontractors Association has put together. And you'll see the kind of format will be that we'll talk about, for instance, scope of work. Uh, you'll see that we have some language that you will have may have seen in the past. Um, then we'll talk about what some recommended language would be potentially, and then why they're what those impacts could be to you if you don't make these changes or identify these issues in your contracts. And then there'll be several slides after that, which I'll probably flip through pretty quick just for time today. But they're going to publish these so you can see later. So as you go have these discussions with your customers. Um, you've got the information and the counter arguments to some of the common arguments from contractors and others about why you should accept their terms. So with that said, um, like I said earlier, these are the slides that I did today are excerpts from a compilation of tips that came out of a American Subcontractors Association document. Um, and they've got a copyright on there. So we just ask you if you're, if you share this information that you get out of here today, that you do it sparingly and, and not uh, publish it to other um, things like that because that's a document that a number of attorneys have put together uh, for us. All right, so first, let's go through a scope of work. You know, um, what you'll see out there sometimes is this language here, is that you'll furnish all material, labor, and equipment um, necessary to do the job. And they really kind of put, throw the kitchen sink at it uh, of, of things that you've got to provide. Um, what we recommend in these situations is the suggested language that your scope of work include only the following and that would be a, a as itemized a scope as you can provide um, but those you know you'll see these key elements below here uh, you've got the uh, you know kind of a, a numbering system of some sort of denomination of whatever it is if it's square footage in our case of curtain wall or panel something like that uh, you might have some um, some relevant portions of the project. Uh, I recommend sheets or at least excluding um, some of the, um, the sheets from the, um, from the uh, mechanical, 
the structural and then the electrical sheets uh, because we found in the past that there'll be uh, details and things that we didn't look for in those sheets um, that are included or something gets snuck in. It's something you may want to consider. Um, obviously, you ought to be reviewing all those as often as possible, but it's really hard to dig through some of that information looking for a needle in a haystack. And then last is a statement that the work is to be in, court, in accordance with um, certain sections of the specifications. I think a lot of us do that, but uh, being careful and trying to limit that is, uh, is always helpful, not only for the customer, but uh, for you to protect you. Um, if you look at scope of work and what the impact has on these, on this, these clauses, is that, um, you know, we've probably all had this where you find that you disagree with, uh, with our customers, the contractors, about what we're actually supposed to be doing on the job, what's included in our bid, our contract. And then you could also find that that uh, scope of work and the cost has expanded and comes right out of your pocket. And that's something early on that could have been prevented with a simple conversation. Uh, as I said, here's some negotiating tips and I'll do this one just for example, uh, but these will be, we're gonna record this today and then these will be available on a link later uh, for uh, everybody participating and attending today. But for this, you know, for this first one, if a contractor says, you know, hey, this owner's very demanding and doesn't know what they want, I need you to stay flexible on the scope, you know, and then a good response to them is, hey, like you, I'm committed to giving them the best job possible, but all I can bid and do, or the documents currently contain additional items that we didn't talk about when I put the bid together, you know, we need to work the pricing out early, you know, on these items now, or go back to our original bid on the scope. So that's one of, you know, this one, for instance, I have put in one, two, three different negotiating tips that you can use. So some of these will pertain to stuff that you've seen or may see in the future, and it's a good reference point to have uh, after today. Uh, the second thing that we've seen is design designation uh, more and more. We're kind of a mid-sized company. Uh, I know the larger glass companies see a lot of design designation, and uh, we've actually purchased um, uh, professional liability insurance for design. We still try to exclude it and stay away from it, but it seems like more and more we end up tweaking a detail or doing something, and I just think as an attorney that there's some risk that comes with that. Um, but more and more as we go forward, talking to other subcontractors and even contractors, design delegation, they're expecting more from us. To, they're not experts. They got too many things to deal with, and if we can't help them, they're in trouble, and that trouble will end up flowing downhill to us. Uh, so what you may see is something like this is the customers requested that the architecture prepare documents uh, which are to be completed and, and, and accurate but then it says the subcontractor acknowledges and represents uh, that it has not and will not rely upon any representations by the customer or the customer's agents so it's saying basically the contractor is saying whatever they tell you their interpretation of the documents is won't stand anywhere that you any and deviations you make and we end up making those uh, is on you you know, we say uh, kind of suggested language is that, you know, any design services that we provide uh, will be reviewed by the designer and signed off by the architect and then integrated so that they end up holding the design responsibility and their professional liability insurance covers it instead of you. It also says that, the you know, customers entitled to rely on the accuracy and completeness of the design services or certificates provided. So it's saying basically whatever's been agreed to and signed off by y'all is now the document. We're seeing a lot of, along these lines, um, architects that say they stamp documents reviewed, not approved anymore. So if you do shop drawings that are a reflection of your interpretation of their drawings, they'll say, I reviewed that. Well, that's great. Is that what you wanted or not? I need an approval here so that I can move forward. Otherwise, I'm accepting responsibility for that detail uh, later. Um, if you look at the impact on the subcontractor, you know, we can find ourselves uh, with design responsibility, and design responsibility is strict liability. If you misdesign the, um, you know, a detail or something like that, that liability may not be covered in your standard builder's risk. Um, you might also find a, a, that you're not licensed and insured for that responsibility. Uh, theoretically, an architect or somebody could uh, could get you pinged by the state for not having uh, the right certificates and stamp and doing work that you're not supposed to. Like attorneys can't practice without a license. So some states have the same thing for engineers and architects. 
And then also uh, you can find that a, uh, a, a disclaimer of, of uh, plans and specs is a, a problem on the project. If the architect won't sign off and won't uh, look at those and give you approval on those, uh, you may have a project you, you know, if you can figure that out early on, you, you may want to change your decision on where not to take that project with that customer. So just gives you an opportunity to say no early on before uh, it's too late and you're uh, neck deep in the project. Uh, once again, there's a couple of negotiating tips here that you can see later. Just talking about some common things that have, you know, we get these from, uh, we do an award called uh, SAP Award, Subcontractors is Prey. And some of these statements have come from people submitting, hey, I have a contract that reads this or a contractor says that, and we've done some common responses to those. Um, next, protection of the work. This has been common back and forth with a number of our clients. Uh, and, you know, the contract may say the co subcontractor shall protect its work here under and be liable for any loss or damage to any work in place and to any of the subcontractor's material and equipment on the site. Uh, we've had a number of times where another subcontractor will run a lift into a window. We had a situation where <clears throat> a mason uh, was supposed to have capped the bottom of a wall and they were doing a poured wall and they poured uh, an entire load of uh, concrete down the front of uh, one of our uh, curtain walls. And had we not pushed back on language like this, we would have been stuck with it. So what I you know, uh, what I like better is to say, you know, subcontractor is not responsible for damage to its work by other parties. The first one, the second one, the alternate is more of what I've been agreeing to, and that is that we protect, you know, we'll protect our stuff from ours, but liable for losses only to the extent caused by our negligence. Uh, it's understood that blah, 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 the insurance, I really like it where it says we'll be responsible for any damage we do to anyone else's work, which is the intent of most of these clauses but it's not the way it operates if you don't have this discussion early on. Um, so the impacts to you is that you may be forced to be responsible for someone else's damage. You may have put a curtain wall in four months ago and be on the other side of the project. If somebody damages it and the contractor can't figure out uh, who did it and that person will not own up to it, if they choose to, they can push back on you and make you replace that curtain wall at your cost, even though you are nowhere in the vicinity and everyone has seen it put up right, clean, and, pro and properly done for months. So the next line item there is that you get it, uh, you know, unexpected expenses to repair something that was not your fault. Uh, once again, we got some negotiating tips on how to have that conversation with uh, some of your customers. Um, next, and this has been kind of a, a, a national deal, and we've even, a lot of states have got this problem, so that's why I chose it, uh, contractual lien waivers. A lot of times they'll say to the fullest extent permitted by law, you're waiving and releasing any and all lien rights for labor, material, equipment, and services that you've provided. You know, what, what I would suggest is more like this, is that you'll only issue waivers uh, that exclude the lien or bond rights, securing payment of retainage, unbilled changes and claims, which have been asserted in writing. Um, you know, if you do a blanket uh, waiver against that, uh, a lot of times you can conquer it by saying, look, I didn't get money for work that was performed under contract, and that helps. But the fact is, if you'll set this up better, then it gives you a stronger argument if you have to make it, and it uh, significantly expedite your payment later. Uh, it also is a good point early on with your better clients to be, you know, that you'll waive your rights once you've been paid for something and met, but for no more instead of these blanket uh, statements. If you look at the impacts that, that could get you is that you have, uh, you can find that you have no rights in the event of non-payment by the prime contractor or the owner because you've already waived those rights to a lien. You can't go file a lien because their immediate defense is, you've already weighed the rights that you were paid, even though you both know you weren't. Uh, you may give your rights and interests um, that are provided by law. Um, and if you'll look, this last line here is a note that, um, that some states, well, all states, lien rights are, are a matter of law, they're a property right, and so that follows the state law. Uh, you need to be very familiar with what your lien laws are as far as timing, what can and cannot be waived, 
And I would suggest that if you don't have a, a good uh, construction attorney uh, on retainer now that you've dealt, if you've not dealt with this in the past, that you at least dig into it a little bit. There's also some things called Z-Lean and some other uh, lean services that provide some of this information. They won't practice law and give you advice, but they will break down the law in, uh, in smaller bite-sized pieces for you to evaluate yourself. Um, contractors payment bond. This is something we've been dealing with on a national uh, uh, scope more than local. Uh, but what you know, typically what you'll see on the federal level first ends up uh, working its way down to state level and local levels. So this would be good to be on your radar. Um, so most contracts, contractors, contracts don't uh, talk about whether or not they're going to provide you a payment, uh, a payment bond. Uh, that's something you ought to be looking for, and and, uh, and we'll talk about why in just a minute. We suggest that you put something in there that says, you know, the contract is subject to credit approval by the subcontractor, and that you'll be provided with the legal description of the property, the name and address of representative, uh, and owner, and evidence of financing, uh, plus a copy of the customer's payment bond. The first three items, the legal description of the property and all that, are things that you're going to need later for a lien. If you ever need it and trying to get that out of the customer or the owner is uh, nearly impossible when you're in the middle of a, a dispute. Um, but then on the back half, asking about finance and knowing who at least who the bank is or if it's public funding or they doing tax credits, things like that can change um, your lien rights for one. And two, uh, you know, if you know the people in your market, and you know, certain banks are high risk banks or things like that can give you some clues as to what kind of owner you're dealing with and um, as, you're, as you'll see in some of these and even uh, uh, as you talk to your customers we're really providing credit to the owner more than the customer and we'll talk about that with pay if paid and pay when paid clauses in a few minutes but uh, just that you know it's good to know who the ultimate uh, owner is going to be and, and their ability to pay so here's some of the on impacts of the uh, the contractors payment bond you know some sureties have um, you know may not have sufficient uh, liquid assets to pay claims. This is what's happened on the federal deal is they'll put in a bond with um, a low rated bonding company that really doesn't have any assets or uh, federally they're allowed to place assets in lieu of a bond and say, hey, here's a $10 million piece of property that'll secure this job. And then the government will go in, you know, when, when everything goes bad, the government will go in and try to claim the property to pay the subs and find out that the property's not actually worth what they said it was. So having a bond is better than the assets, uh, but you really want to have a bond provided by a good bonding company. Um, and then the second thing is that the, the surety bonds may not be for the full amount of the, of the contract. And uh, occasionally they have really crazy um, uh, processes that you have to go through to actually get paid on the bond. So you just want to make sure that you have an opportunity to look and see that if you find that the, the owner or the contractor scare you a little bit financially, that if they place a bond to try to make you feel better, that that bond is actually as good as it's actually a good rev, you know, way for you to get paid because if the bond is just as bad as the situation. It doesn't help you much. Um, so the impact. Yeah. Okay. Here's some more impacts. I'm sorry. I probably went through these just a second ago when they're on the next slide. Um, so that's this next item here. I was talking about the notice and claims procedures. That's it. It's you may have to go through a bunch of uh, a bunch of processes that you're not used to to try to get paid. And a bonding company is there to pay you, but in in operation, what I have found and what I hear is that bonding companies will also do everything they can to protect their assets and not have to pay <coughs> whenever possible. Um, and then some things they'll put in uh, bond terms and things in the bond that would completely change how you operate it. Let's say they, they offer to finish the job or you're required to finish the job with the bonding company, having to work through with them and keep up with all their rules and regs. A lot of times you'd rather not have the job in the first place than have to do that. Uh, also, um, public construction is not necessarily mean it's good money as we may, as we all know from their states even now that are, not paying their subcontractors and contractors well. So uh, just because it's a publicly funded job 
doesn't mean that it's a good bet or that you're funding uh, and, and offering credit to the right people. All right, uh, so going next to project schedule. Uh, what you can see is that the, you know, the, the subcontractor shall commence your work uh, when directed and then achieve final completion by date. But this, it's agreed that time is of the essence in the subcontract and the subcontractor recognizes the contractor's exclusive right to modify the schedule or sequence of work from time to time without extension of time or additional compensation. We know as uh, the final finishers of the projects how bad that is. All the delays happen up front, dirt work, structure, things like that, and then we end up getting squeezed to try to finish the job on time. Um, I suggest and we suggest that you shall be entitled to equitable adjustment of the contract price, including uh, cost of increased labor, supervision, equipment, and so on and so forth, and I won't read all that for you. But really, we suggest, you know, you need to go through and say, look, I need to have the opportunity to get paid extra. If you want to compress the schedule, that's fine. But if we do, if we've agreed to a project and I'm supposed to have, you know, uh, eight weeks working weeks to do it. And with this amount of manpower that you accelerating, squeezing the schedule or giving the same, you know, same eight weeks. And then I need you to add manpower to get it done. Those kinds of things that uh, you typically have not built that into your cost. I need to have an opportunity to sit down with a contractor and say, you're behind, not me. <clears throat> and you've allowed somebody else to do the job more cheaply by stretching it out. And now I've got to do it in a more expensive manner to catch up for somebody else. That's not really your pocket, Mr. Contractor, I'm trying to get into. It's the mason up front who didn't get the brick done on time or the steel guy who, who was um, delayed putting the steel up. That's their fault, not yours, but it's also not mine. So I shouldn't bear that cost. So the, uh, the impact you could be an earlier than planned subcontract start, which is bad if you don't have your stuff right. Uh, completion dates can be, um, can be shortened, uh, which would hurt you. you know, then you got later start and completion dates, which can mess up your scheduling and also increase your uh, wages and cost. And then uh, this last one, a delayed starting date with no change in the completion date, compressions. So no matter what, when you scheduled your year, according to when they talked about doing the project and the manpower for it, any significant changes in that schedule, although we've been working around that for years, if somebody really has a problem and sticks it, you know, and forces us to fix that, um, there could be significant costs. I know we had a project that got delayed an entire year. And so one year it made my financials hard and we had to really struggle to keep the guys busy. And then the next year the, it popped and we'd already sold other work. So we got, additional works. So we had too much work, a lot of overtime and those costs. So just dealing with the project schedule up front and the contract and making sure that uh, that your customer uh, is dealing fairly with you on that is good. Um, you know, these are some additional items here is timing for performance. It depends on overall progress. And then also weather sensitive, uh, that can be a big deal, especially in some of the colder climates and wetter climates that if they haven't figured that in or even don't properly account for that with the owner, you could be stuck with those costs. All right, payment, it should say payment for storage. I'm sorry, that's a typo. Where'd it go? Sorry, uh, sorry. I skipped that one to go to price, did I skip? Yeah, um, going to price escalation, let me pull my notes here real quick. I'm sorry, I missed a slide there. Got a slide error, it looks like. Um, lost it somewhere in translation here. I'm not gonna have slides on this one part, but I'll go through it real quick uh, because we have this issue in our market quite a bit and they may just be out of order a little bit. And that is payment for uh, stored materials, uh, especially with our universities and things like that. We end up having to carry that information. Let me go back to payment for storage. There you go. Yeah, I'm missing a couple of slides. I'm sorry, those got dropped. I'll make sure those get out. And if uh, at the end, if you ask me specifically, I'll make sure you get them. Um, what you'll see a lot is this payment, subcontractors payment shall only include the value of labor and material or equipment installed in the work. Well, as we all know, we build our stuff, uh, like individually our company manufactures our own stuff. We fabricate our curtain wall and systems. And so um, 
having, we need to pay, you know, and then we'll store it until the project's ready for it. Um, suggested language on that would be that monthly progress payments to the subcontractor shall include the value uh, of material delivered and suitably stored at the job site or an approved off-site location prior to incorporation into the work. Um, those impacts on that is that, you know, we can be deterred from purchasing materials early and equipment ahead of time where you've got them on site and ready to go when they're ready. Uh, second, as we're seeing a lot of now, is price escalation. If you could buy it now and sit on it, it would save the owner or us money in the long run. Uh, next, uh, your cash flows road, if you buy early and can't get paid until they start recognizing it, you're, you're basically financing those materials for the uh, owner. And then last, uh, you can suffer the consequence of slow project progress or getting behind on schedule because you had to order things just in time instead of uh, as needed. So, you know, like you see these negotiating tips here is they'll want you to get it done on time, but they don't want to pay to, to do the preparation work of having the materials on site. Um, once again, I apologize for not having the slides in here, and we'll make sure that those are in the, uh, the final version for everybody when we get these out. Uh, next is price escalation. I thought this was good to talk about now because of um, the notices that we've seen, and, and we're all dealing with clients on this now. Um, what you'll see sometimes in contracts, it says the contract agrees to pay for the performance of its work uh, for the following sum. And it says which shall, unless otherwise specified, include all taxes, premiums, and so on and so forth, and not conditioned upon a firm completion. It says uh, that price should be firm and binding on the subcontractor for the work and not conditioned upon firm completion date or any labor increases or material escalation costs. A lot of times they're just silent on it. What we recommend is that you say a change in the price of an item of material more than 5% or whatever percentage your pain threshold is between the date of the subcontractor's bid proposal and the date of installation shall warrant an equitable adjustment in the subcontract price. I'm hearing a lot of our um, peers are putting price escalation clauses in their contracts because as we've seen, um, they may wait months to go to contract and we know now that there's, you know, eight to 10% out there on the market and then the, when the tariffs just hit and have started hitting, that that's becoming a um, a very relevant deal. The impacts for that escalate those that, that escalation and not having those clauses done properly are as follows. You know, you can uh, you either have to build the contingencies into your bids, which means you could be less competitive, or um, or have those problems. Uh, you may have to absorb the cost of inflation, uh, even when the owner or contractor caused the delays. And then failure to address the uh, escalation during the subcontractor phase may cause you to have to have a battle with your uh, your customer later in the project, which obviously you don't want. There's our negotiating tips, which, oh, there's the store materials. We already went through this, so I'm just going to flip through these real quick, but these slides are they're just out of order. So I'll reorder those before we get them out to everybody, but at least they're here and I don't have to retype them. So a little a little good news for me. All right, um, let's see here. All right, the last couple we've got to do here, it looks like, is we've got the pay of pay clause and then indemnity and hold harmless. So pay of paid, and this is a big one because we see this a lot in uh, litigation and then um, with the bonding even. So it says payment of the approved portion of the subcontract monthly estimate should be conditioned upon receipt by uh, the contractor. The next one is contractor will pay subcontractor only if they have been paid. And then the third one is receipt of payment from the owner um, by the contractor is an absolute condition to your right to payment. So what we say is subcontractor does not accept the risk of customer's receipt of payments from any source and in no event will payments to subcontractor be based upon or subject to customer's receipt of payment for subcontractor's work. Pay when paid is similar, it's better than this. It's kind of a light version of this. So if you had to negotiate down to that would help, but really you want to get out of that. You're, you want to say, um, you know, that's your job to go get yourself paid and then you owe me. Uh, the impact of this can be that uh, you're bearing the risk of credit uh, to the owner. Um, you may not be able to take legal steps against the owner because you don't have a direct contract. Your contract's with the contractor. 
all you have is lien rights. Uh, you can do some third party stuff, but it's really difficult sometimes to flow through and get that. And pay us paid gives the contractor a good defense against you. And then obviously you have no control over um, payment delays from the owner. And if you go try to get paid from them, that shakes things up too. So pay us paid, if you can work on that um, or avoid people who you know have payment issues is best. But second best, if you know that and can negotiate your pay of pay clauses out, uh, you'll be a lot better off. All right, and the last one we'll talk about, uh, just because there's been a lot of this and we've actually did some legal work in Arkansas last year that's made it better for us, and then we'll wrap up. So indemnity and hold harmless clauses. The contractor shall defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the contractor, other subs, the architect, the owner, and anybody else basically they feel is related from all claims for bodily injury and property damage arising out of the performance of your work. We suggest that you say any indemnification or hold harmless obligation extends only to the claims related to bodily injury and property damage, and then only to that part of the, or proportion of the claim caused by the negligence or intentional act of, of you or us, uh, our subcontractors, our employees, and others who are our agents. Um, so if you look at the impact and, and here's what happens with these is, uh, for instance, uh, something else we're seeing is watch out for uh, workers comp claims or, um, language to try to work around your workers comp is, uh, we've had some subcontractors whose employees got hurt on a job and then they ran through the workers comp money, but then they went and sued the contractor for the additional losses or damages. And then the contractor used the indemnity clause to go back around and get the employer again. So if you've got workers' comp insurance and feel like that's kind of your absolute, that's all we got to pay, well, these guys had to pay again. And so we changed our law in Arkansas now where it's balanced, uh, proportional, and, and, I, and I now cut out workers' comp reach arounds so that one of my employees can't get back in my pocket a second time after also getting workers' comp insurance. But it's the impact of these, if you don't do these right, it's that you get into paying claims for somebody else's negligence. You get into paying for claims from a whole different number of people that you had no idea you might be liable for, or and even just brought in for the cost of defense can be bad. Um, like I said, this third one here, if, a, if your employees are on the job and it rises out of their work, then they um, then they can come back, you know, they can come back and reach around through these indemnity to get you. And then that fourth one, subcontractors' work is damaged because of someone else's negligence. Then they can also, and you know, you could have to indemnify that person for damaging your materials. So um, that is the end of the slides here, and I think we've got uh, we want we're a, a minute or two over on this. So if you want to open up and unmute and talk, uh, have any specific questions, I'll be glad to answer those uh, before everybody runs off back to work. Great. Thanks, Courtney. I'm going to reclaim the host for a minute so I can change those audio settings. Please, please take it. I'll stop sharing. Okay. All right. Everyone should be unmuted if you have questions. Are there any questions this afternoon? I have a question. Great. Please. Who's this? So, uh, this is Carl Newhouse of Sage. Oh, yay. So, uh, a question is, is so in the presentation, you, you reference a lot uh, from a contractor perspective. What uh -huh. happens if you're, if you're just a material supplier? Do, you, do a lot of these same scenarios hold true, or are there... Are there substantial differences when it comes to just the materials provider because uh, they're not necessarily a, a, a subcontractor? No, that's absolutely correct. Um, there are some distinct differences if you are a, a material supplier. For instance, the lien rights in some states only flow down um, to the subcontractor or its subs. Occasionally, a material, you know, the um, uh, occasionally they will include the material supplier. Uh, but I would I would know your state law on that. Um, let's see, let me pull these lists here. Let's see, there's a couple others 
The um, obviously the scope of work, y'all have the same issues and probably are better than a lot of subcontractors are at defining your scope. But it would help us a lot and your your own stuff if you define and we need to work at communicating that better between the parties. Um, protection of work, probably not so much because you're not on site. But design responsibility, um, occasionally, you know, y'all usually have internal engineers doing things. But if you have a salesperson, anybody like that out in the architect's office who helps with any design stuff, and then it ends up in the project without it being drawn in the way they should and they stamp it themselves, there's an argument to be made that you help design that and could be held um, liable for that. So that would be a concern, I think, for material suppliers. Um, the lien waivers. Same thing, the biggest deal for lien waivers is y'all helping us process those quickly because we typically have to give those for, mater for our material suppliers and making sure that we have a good process and that y'all waive no more than, uh, than what you've been paid. Um, and then, uh, let's see, last, price escalation. Same thing, giving good notices and clean language that we can forward on to the owner and contractor and say you've been given an ample amount of time to make decisions and understand that this this change is coming. Please get your order in or be subject to that escalation. Um, and I think that's the biggest deal. Y'all don't do pay a pay, so you're better off there, and you really don't have to hold harmless. So those are the three or four I would think as a material supplier would be either directly affect you or provide an opportunity for you to help your customers. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, Courtney, for giving this presentation today. A lot of information here to digest. Um, <laughs> we'll be, we've recorded this session and we'll be posting it on the members only portal of glasswebsite.com. That should be available in the next week or so, along with um, the downloadable version of these slides. Yep, and I'll fix it. And I, once again, I apologize for getting those slate. When I was uh, fixing them this morning, I missed, uh, I misordered those, and I'll get that fixed. So the final version with the tips and things in, the reason I did that organization is so later, if you want to reference these slides, you'll have the negotiating tips kind of in the category together with them so that you don't have to dig through and try to find that later. So hopefully that'll be a good reference point for you uh, on these subjects. And like I said, these were 10 out of about 40 or 50 that I chose to uh, to show. So if you've got any other questions, um, they've got my contact information. I'd be glad to get you some more information. Excellent. Sounds like a webinar uh, uh, continuance there, Courtney. Sounds like we got more in a series here, I think. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of potential here. Great, well on your screen now, you should be seeing a list of other upcoming events being put on by NGA. Um, I just hope you'll take a look at those and consider uh, attending. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for coming and have a great rest of the day. Thanks y'all too. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.